Oleg Antonovich Gordievsky. To the Russian intelligence services, this is the name of the greatest traitor to their country's history. To the West, this is the man who saved the world from nuclear hellfire. He may just be the most important double agent in history, even though it cost him attempts on his life from his former compatriots that last to this day. Gordievsky was born into the elite of Soviet communists in 1938. His father was an NKVD agent, Joseph Stalin's infamous secret police and forerunner of the KGB. Gordievsky's family loyalties to the communist cause were without question, and at the young age of 21 years old, Gordievsky joined the Foreign Service, being stationed in East Berlin in 1961. A polyglot, Gordievsky learned to speak German perfectly, which would aid his operations through West Germany, and he was also able to speak Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian. Though young, he was already widely regarded as cunning, intelligent, and bright. Gordievsky would surely live up to his father's legacy and serve the Soviet Union proudly. There was just one problem. Gordievsky would soon find himself ethically at odds with his own motherland. It began during his 1961 posting to East Berlin, where he got to watch the Berlin Wall finish construction. Families were torn apart, sometimes the tall concrete wall splitting one half of a family from the other living across the street in free Berlin. Food shortages were almost immediate, and Berliners' freedoms curtailed even more than usual in the Soviet-occupied areas. For Gordievsky, even the heavy indoctrination via Soviet propaganda was doing little to stop his distaste for his own nation's actions. A deep ideological rift began to grow inside of him, only widened by his frequent experiences thanks to his work with the Foreign Service with the Free Societies of the West. Nevertheless, Gordievsky went on to join the KGB two years later, following in his father's footsteps. The KGB was without a doubt the world's premier intelligence agency, with at its height nearly a million agents, informants, and analysts working all over the world. The early Russian communists had learned well the game of espionage, infiltrating workers' movements all over Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century, in a bid to establish an ongoing cultural revolution across Europe. For the young Soviet Union, it was believed that the new state could only survive if communist revolution spread to nearby nations, and thus, from its very creation, espionage was at the heart of the Soviet Union. The British MI6 and the American CIA may have dabbled in their fair amount of controversy, but the KGB operated almost without restraint. The intelligence agency took pride in their any-means-necessary approach to surveillance, intelligence gathering, and sabotage, often employing torture, intimidation, and outright murder. An entire KGB laboratory was dedicated to the development of clandestine weapons with which to kill public figures, and hundreds of Eastern European politicians, artists, and cultural icons met their end at the hands of the KGB. KGB. The only way to remain safe from the KGB was to tightly tow the party line, and Gordievsky had just joined this most infamous of spy agencies, despite his growing doubts in the Soviet system. It wouldn't be until the invasion of Czechoslovakia that Gordievsky's doubts turned into a burning hatred for the entire Soviet government and everything it stood for. Czechoslovakia had been a stable democracy in Central Europe up until the Second World War. Finding itself on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain after the end of the war, Czechoslovakia soon found its traditional freedom stripped away and and replaced with Soviet-style communism. Despite this, the nation remained relatively stable until the 1960s. As the Czech economy began to shrink, reforms were slowly implemented, though still constrained by the template of Soviet communism. This led to even greater discontent amongst the people, and in 1968 the conservative head of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia was replaced with a much more liberal Alexander Dubček. Dubček immediately implemented major reforms, shying away from Soviet policies. His end of national censorship, however, lit a fire that was difficult to put out. Many conservative Czechs feared angering the Soviet Union by drifting too far away from the Soviet template. But liberal Czechs demanded a more fair and open economy and government. While the Dubček government tried to keep reforms within the bounds of Soviet communism, many were calling for a return to a democratic system. For the Soviet Union, the liberal Czechoslovakia threatened to export its revolution to other Soviet bloc states. This was not something it could tolerate. On August 20, 1968, the Warsaw Pact invaded the tiny country, immediately ending its young revolution. Clashes between protesters and Warsaw troops led to civilians being gunned down in the streets, but within a year Czechoslovakia was once more back in the Warsaw Pact fold. For Gordievsky, the Soviet Union's oppression of the Czech people would prove to be the straw that broke the camel's back. He vowed to work against the very state itself, saying this brutal attack on innocent people made me hate it, the communist regime, with a burning, passionate hatred. Gordievsky knew that the best way to fight back against the Soviet Union was from within, and so he tried to discreetly get the attention of foreign intelligence services, dropping subtle hints that he was willing to be recruited. As the Czech Revolution was squashed, Gordievsky served in the Soviet consulate in Denmark. He knew the 
the Danish Secret Service taped the embassy's outgoing phone calls, and thus he placed a call to his wife, making his distaste and dissatisfaction with the Soviet Union colorfully apparent. The Danish Secret Service, however, missed the subtle signal. However, at the same time that Gordievsky was considering defecting, another Soviet defector to the West had already pointed him out as a potential recruit, given his ideological differences with the Soviet government. Danish officials tried to move on that information, though this time it would be Gordievsky that missed the signal. Believing him to be gay, the Danish Secret Service sent a handsome young agent to make contact with Gordievsky. The two met at a reception in the home of a West German diplomat, with the young agent immediately striking up a conversation. He invited Gordievsky to go to a local pub and have a drink together, but Gordievsky refused. The British would try their hand next, figuring that if Gordievsky wasn't gay, maybe he'd go for a more traditional honeypot. They sent a beautiful young dentistry student to flirt with Gordievsky, and the two shared several drinks together in a brief conversation. Ultimately, though, Gordievsky simply walked away, faithful to his wife. With the failure of their honeypot operation, the British decided to be more direct. The head of the local MI6 station himself took on the assignment of flipping Gordievsky. Kept under surveillance, Gordievsky's every movement was tracked, which allowed the station head to run into Gordievsky seemingly by chance at various diplomatic receptions and local sports clubs. After several weeks of back and forth, the British agent finally simply offered for them to meet in private. There could only be one thing a British official would want to chat with the Soviet spy about in private. Gordievsky agreed. Gordievsky's conversion came as a much-needed relief to the West. Up until now, they had few, if any, successful agents inside the Soviet Union. They had absolutely none within the halls of Soviet power itself. By comparison, the Soviets had been running successful spy rings in the US and Britain for years. In the words of CIA Director Richard Helms, planting a spy within the KGB itself was as improbable as placing resident spies on the planet of Mars. The British passed on Gordievsky's intelligence to their CIA counterparts, but absolutely refused to reveal the identity of their agent within the KGB. This troubled the CIA, as the MI6 had been played by Soviet triple agents on numerous occasions, and an immediate investigation was launched to discover the identity of the British mole. Within two years, Gordievsky's name popped up as the most likely identity of the British source, though it did little to calm the fears of the CIA that Gordievsky was playing a triple agent, pretending to be a double agent while still loyal to the Soviet Union. This was partly due to the fact that Gordievsky appeared to be too good to be true. The son of a well-respected NKVD man, Gordievsky had early access to the higher echelons of Soviet intelligence. What's more, he refused to be paid for his work, instead claiming to be fueled by an ideological hatred for the Soviet government. Gordievsky betrayed his country, not because he hated it, but because he hated the Soviet system itself. His espionage was not an act of rebellion, but an act of cultural revolution, with the express intent of speeding the collapse of Soviet communism. Gordievsky provided MI6 with an intelligence gold mine. He would frequently steal rolls of microfilm from the Soviet embassy in Denmark during his lunch breaks, then surreptitiously pass them off to a British agent posing as a bystander outside. The British would hurriedly copy the microfilm with a special portable device built specifically for this purpose, and then return the film to Gordievsky who would replace it upon re-entering the embassy. This gave the British unprecedented access to troves of secret Soviet documents, memos, briefings, and meeting notes. Gordievsky also proved to have an incredible memory, and was adept at accurately recalling information without embellishing or adding false elements. At a local safe house, he would brief his handlers on the exact details of the workings inside the Soviet embassy, including high-profile meetings with VIPs and the details of secret communiques from Moscow itself. The exchange was two-way, however, and the British actively worked to get Gordievsky promoted within the KGB. To this end, they fed Gordievsky a steady stream of what is known as chicken feed in spy jargon, vast amounts of real intelligence on the British government that had very little actual intelligence value. They even went on to set up meetings with Gordievsky and real British sources, who conveyed factual information that was in fact tactically worthless. This however impressed Gordievsky's KGB bosses, and soon he was promoted to serve in London itself. Gordievsky's posting in London would soon reveal the greatest threat Britain had ever faced, a KGB agent elected as Prime Minister of of the United Kingdom. In 1981, Gordievsky told his British handlers that MP Michael Foote, head of the Labour Party and candidate for Prime Minister in the coming election, had actually served as a paid KGB agent. Foote had supplied detailed information on the internal politics of the Labour Party, as well as how the party viewed issues such as the American War in Vietnam. British intelligence found itself in a conundrum. They only had Gordievsky's intelligence marking Foote as a Soviet contact, far from enough evidence to take any legal action against him, but if they did nothing, they risked 
putting a Soviet agent in 10 Downing Street. Though placed under strict observation, Foote would go on to lose the election in 1984, and the problem resolved itself as Foote resigned as Labour Party leader. However, Gordievsky's greatest service to the West would be his help in averting all-out nuclear war. In 1983, the US and NATO had a slew of major military exercises in the works. Unknown to the West, the Soviet Union had grown increasingly paranoid and afraid of an American first strike against them, and now the major military exercises planned in Europe seemed to them as a covert plan to mobilize for war and launch a surprise attack. Rushing to his British handlers, Gordievsky delivered a copy of a cable sent from Moscow to its London embassy, warning that the US and NATO were contemplating a nuclear first strike and would be able to do so less than two weeks after reaching that decision. Gordievsky also filled in the British on current operations by the Soviets, who believed a worst-case scenario was imminent. This included surveillance at missile bases in the UK, government bunkers, and 10 Downing Street itself. At first sign of frantic activity, an alarm would be sounded to Moscow that nuclear war was imminent. One wrong move by either side and the world would be bathed in nuclear hellfire. The British passed their intelligence along to the US, who immediately took action to curtail the extent of its planned military exercises. To the US, this news came as a surprise. Up until then, the Soviets had been seen as a dominating force hell-bent on global domination. In reality, Gordievsky's intelligence showed that Soviet officials were terrified of going to war against the US, and even more afraid that the US would launch a devastating nuclear first strike. Ironically, the US spent much of the Cold War just as afraid of the Soviet Union. Both sides had no plans to ever launch a nuclear first strike, and yet both sides believed that the other was extremely likely to do just that. Thanks to Gordievsky's intelligence, the US not only changed its planned exercises, but changed its operational methodology and diplomatic tone. This led to an immediate easing of tensions between the two Cold War rivals, and the world stepped back once more from the brink of nuclear annihilation. Eventually, though, Gordievsky would come under Soviet suspicion. In mid-May 1985, Gordievsky was suddenly ordered back to Moscow. His British handlers urged him to immediately defect, but Gordievsky decided to return to Moscow, perhaps hoping to allay suspicions against him and continue his work to undermine the KGB and the Soviet Union. Upon arrival, though, he was taken to a KGB safe house, where he was force-fed brandy spiked with a truth serum and extensively questioned for a week. Meanwhile, his home was broken into and searched, with KGB agents spraying his shoes and clothes with an invisible radioactive powder that would allow them to track him and the places he visited with the use of special glasses. Unable to prove their suspicions, the KGB was forced to release Gordievsky, though continued its extensive surveillance. He was, however, restricted from working abroad. Gordievsky knew that he needed to escape, but no Western spy had ever escaped from the KGB's clutches before. The MI6 was anxious to recover the man who had provided them with two decades of intelligence and managed to make contact with him while under KGB surveillance. The agency had had an elaborate escape plan already in place for years, fearing the day that the KGB would wisen up to Gordievsky. One night at 7.30 p.m., Gordievsky walked to a specific street corner while carrying a Safeway supermarket bag. This signaled to the British that he was ready to be extradited. A British agent then walked past Gordievsky while carrying a Harold's shopping bag and eating a Mars bar. The two locked eyes for a brief moment. The escape was on. On July 19, 1985, Gordievsky went for a jog as usual. However, this time he managed to suddenly evade his KGB tails and boarded a train to Vyborg near the Finnish border. KGB border posts all along the Soviet Union were put on high alert, but Gordievsky managed to make it to a British embassy car waiting for him at the train station. He was quickly shoved into the trunk of a British car, and the driver worked to lose his KGB tail before making it across the border to Finland. From there, Gordievsky was flown directly to the UK, where he officially defected. Gordievsky would be sentenced to death in absentia for his defection, and though modern Russia cannot legally carry the sentence out due to its membership in the Council of Europe, it hasn't stopped the attempts on Gordievsky's life. In one incident, Gordievsky became seriously ill after being given poison-laced sleeping pills by a contact. Today, Gordievsky is alive and well, and continues to be unafraid of what the Russian government may do to him. For him, the mission at last succeeded with the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. Now, go watch Who Are the Most Successful Spies of All Time, or click this other video instead. Obey Comrade Infographics.